so uh, to start off then, um, you know, obviously the objectives of the government and the society at large right now is to stop this disease also to understand what is happening, to use data in order to understand what's happening, and of course, maintain and, and build public trust at the same time as they are attempting to combat the disease. So to walk through some specific sort of general things uh, that we think around the uh, legal regime, Javier may go into greater detail later, but the general data protection regulation has broad general provisions explaining that that data can be used in an emergency like this. It even talks about um, specific medical emergencies a little bit in the recitals, um, but it doesn't stop existing uh, just because data is used. So very much unlike uh, the comments made by Matt Hancock, there are not exemptions. There are There is a, a legal regime which maintains itself while consent is perhaps not, and, and, and sort of is no longer the exact model. Uh, it's not about consent anymore perhaps, but it is uh, nevertheless, all the other sorts of data protection things uh, are maintained. Um, the Data Protection Act has more specific things. There are schedules in the Data Protection Act which deal with emergency use of data. However, our feeling about the Data Protection Act is that there, it, it lacks uh, clarity around what exactly uh, the rights that we have under GDPR, how they are maintained or best maintained within those scenarios. So it doesn't talk about, you know, data uh, minimization, doesn't talk about those things or doesn't even reiterate that those things continue to be there. So um, there is, uh, you know, that's that's a little bit perhaps vague and is perhaps also potentially leading to the government to not thinking through exactly how these two um, legal instruments interact. Um, so summary, data protection allows action to take place. That's very clear and of course that is needed. The general requirements stay in place, things like data security, data minimization, and of course necessity and proportionality. Um, so just to take that idea, sorry for my spelling here, um, so our own necessity and proportionality. Of course, uh, necessity test, taking action is clearly necessary. Doesn't necessarily mean this action is necessary. So you've still got to kind of be left with not too many uh, options on this. Um, I think the proportionality is probably the more interesting of these uh, in a sense, because if the actions under data protection still need to be proportionate. That means that they've got to be practical. They've got to be effective. You know, they've got to deliver a result. Otherwise, they're clearly neither necessary nor proportionate. Um, and in some ways, this is a kind of a common sense test. Does this is this going to be a a, a practical way forward, where uh, the the right results are are going to be delivered? So. Some of the suggestions I think that are going around around mobile data, which we've got to touch on later, don't really feel very practical or effective and might even be counterproductive. And if, so if the use of data is actually likely to frighten people or um, misinform them, it clearly isn't a proportionate response. So I think really assessing whether the use of data is necessary and proportionate is, is going to interact a lot with how we understand the disease and the spread of the disease and what we think the behavioral changes that are likely to result from this are and of course integral to that is trust so if, if things start undermining trust that uh, kind of goes away um, and in with necessity and proportionality we would say also these assessments must be recorded you know, if you can't we show after the fact, you know, in six or 12 months time, how these decisions were reached, then really you haven't decided whether they're necessary or proportionate. And it's impossible to say why you did those things. So the government must, must record these assessments. Um, so the other really key thing here, of course, is, is transparency. If we're going to use data in novel ways, uh, the requirements for transparency, although they're not specified, they don't disappear. 
Um, you know, people still have a right to be informed around the use of their data. And again, from the point of view of maintaining trust, that seems to us to be absolutely critical. Um, and just to say that I think at this point is our biggest worry about the UK's policy response. The government has said nothing very directly about how it wants to approach this problem of use of data in novel ways of tracking the disease of understanding it. Of course, it's a critical part of what they're doing. You know, the only way they can assess their policies to get data, the only way that they can, um, you know, really know whether they're being effective is, is through the use of data, which may mean the use of personal data that people did not expect. So we've had two examples in the last week of uh, what the government actually is doing, and they, they haven't been announced really by government. They're kind of leaking out the sides. Um, and the first was uh, their discussions with mobile companies about use of aggregate data to track population movements. And on the face of it, this seems like a perfectly reasonable step. Uh, there may be necessity to explain to mobile phone companies customers that this is taking place some people might be opted out from those systems um, and they may they probably should be allowed to remain opted out nevertheless uh, this isn't you know it's aggregate data that's being supplied to the government the analysis is all the tools already there so the privacy intrusion to the extent that those exist already exist this isn't a new privacy in, intrusion so it seems a reasonably se sensible step uh, nevertheless the government did not communicate about this it just leaked and they continue to say nothing about it in fact refused to talk to the uh, press when they asked about it i don't think that's a good way of uh, proceeding as it just kind of sets up an atmosphere of mistrust and confusion and potentially um you know allows rumor and other things to start to uh you know fill the gap the second example, um, which I think is more worrying, and no doubt we'll explore it more, is the involvement of the um, technology company. It started off its life mostly in working in surveillance and hacking of uh, foreign actors. Uh, the company Palantir uh, is now set to supply the NHS with systems to analyze and understand um, appears like the use of things like hospital beds and monitor the distribution of resources and um, now that in itself is not about personal data but palantir are all about personal data um, they're not a company that kind of inspires confidence from privacy advocates who've been having to deal variously from the with the fallout from from many of their uh, tools and programs down the years um, and you know for them to suddenly be involved you know uh, through government fiat without any kind of procurement procedure without any kind of competitive tendering of course that's rather difficult in circumstances but nevertheless they aren't a company with a as I understand it a track record of involvement in uh, the health service as such or within the health sector although they've had ambitions apparently um, suddenly they're involved in the NHS. Now, currently that's non-personal data, but do we think that this company's ambitions are going to stop at that point? I think that's very debatable. So um, this is a worrying move. And again, the government could clear all this up by saying, we understand that Palantir are a company with reputational challenges. Uh, we wouldn't allow them to step into the field of personal data in this crisis they could say that they're not saying anything so this again is only going to produce speculation and fear so at this point it feels like the government's response is very weak in this area uh, it's not perhaps the only area where uh, communications issues have occurred but uh, this is uh, in our view quite serious because it has a great deal of potential to undermine the overall policy response against COVID-19. Um, so elsewhere, to kind of give a flavour of the sorts of things that are happening elsewhere, there are things like surveillance measures being used, uh, often quite intrusive, uh, you know, tracking of individuals, sometimes tagging of individuals, sometimes using Bluetooth and other sorts of things to, to know where people are, particularly if they're potentially infectious. 
Um, those sort of surveillance measures have been uh, put in place elsewhere. It's used for data for police enforcement measures. Um, apparently, you know, CCTV cameras, facial recognition technologies and other things have been suggested in various places. And of course, there's a lot of talk about the use of mobile data to track individuals and potentially say, you know, this person's at risk or not, or this area is at risk, that kind of thing. So, uh, and of course, other kinds of data come into that. Um, I think uh, Javier might talk a little bit about some of those examples later, but our understanding of this is that mobile data is not really suitable for deducing risk in this area because it can't really mobile data in particular is just not granular enough you know it's like accurate to 50 or 100 or 200 meters that doesn't really tell you if you've come into sufficient contact with somebody if they're infectious um you know maybe if it's combined with other data this can help but again you've got to understand the nature of the risk that's very hard to do for mobile data alone you know has this person been uh, you know, very close proximity, uh, or are they, have they been keeping a sort of two meter distance? You know, this isn't something you can find out from mobile data. Um, so it's, it's actually very hard, I think, in practice for this to be useful in the way that some people believe it might be. Um, and of course, you know, if you're telling somebody that they're at an extremely low risk, but nevertheless a risk, you're likely to frighten them. You could get them to turn up at hospital, all kinds of things which are inappropriate. So you've got to be really, really careful about thinking through how to use mobile data. Um, it probably isn't the silver bullet that many people seem to believe it is. Um, that's kind of it. Uh, I say very, very brief, very top level. Um, but, you know, the key thing for us is we need the government to maintain trust. And at this point, really isn't it's being silent and silence breeds problems in an environment like this it needs to be a lot more forthcoming about how it wants to use data nobody's going to object to the government solving this problem uh, using personal data in unexpected ways that is not going to be a problem for anybody the problems will arise if that either ends up being deeply inappropriate as in ineffective or counterproductive or if it uh, is is not discussed that those are where where we're going to get problems um so for the rest of this as mike said we're going to kind of open this up um, I, I think Javier may have some remarks to make if he's uh, on the call yeah javier is um, here would you like to um yeah chime and in, then, javier? Uh, hang on a sec um and then um the then we'll obviously open it up to questions but I also really value everybody's thoughts about strategy around this because it's going to be quite easy for this to be a little bit under the surface until it becomes a problem. You know, it's going to be very easy for the government to kind of ignore this as there's only privacy advocates. Who's going to worry? No one's going to worry. And then, of course, something breaks and people don't like it and then it becomes a problem. And then they wish they listened to us. But, you know, we, we, we want to avoid that if we can. Thank you. So Javier, do you want to come in? Yes. Hi. Uh, I don't know if you can see me as well, hear me. We can. Yeah. So, yeah, so basically for the, um, for the past uh, couple of weeks, we've, um, I guess like many people working on this area, we've been trying to understand, you know, what, um, A, what is the um, regulation of this area in the UK and also what's, uh, what the UK government is doing, which, as uh, Jim has explained, has not been really um, publicized uh, to the level that we think is required. But also looking at what other countries are doing around the world, and um, there are lots and lots of media reports in, um, out there. You know, like New York Times, for example, you know, they've been doing a really, really good job, for example. And then, um, but it's uh, it's actually quite hard to. It has been quite hard. I think we now get a sense of uh, what's actually, you know, what are the main approaches. I think uh, something that we we need to understand first of all is that we haven't reached uh, in the UK the point where the use of data 
um, is going to is being used to actually enforce um, policy. I think that at the moment, um, all the discussions that we've seen in the UK are about uh, using data to try to help government understand whether what they are doing, you know, like the measures that they are advocating are working on a general level. But the, um, the two main things that, um, the two main interventions uh, to deal with the pandemic, you know, if you want to actually, if the state actually wanted to, to force uh, behavior, uh, would be uh, enforced quarantine, you know, forcing you to stay at home and um, obtaining data to do contact tracing, to know if you are, infor if you are uh, infected, to know who you may have been with. And those are the two main um, quite previously intrusive uh, uses of data that were. And what we don't know is at what point uh, the UK may want to start doing these things in a more serious level. For example, when the lockdown starts to open and then you need to really know, you know, you're going to have people in the street who may or may not be infected. There is a concern that they, there could be pressure to try to really enforce quite seriously that if you are sick, you know, you really cannot get out of the house. And if you are and if you are sick, you also need to really tell the government who you've been with. Now, as Jim has said, you know, it's very unclear whether some of these technologies would achieve uh, those um, methods. I mean, there are solutions out there that people are trying to figure out. So, for example, for uh, for enforcing the quarantine uh, in Poland, uh, the government has created an app that will force you to take a selfie at random times during the day. That is also geolocated to show that you're actually, you're actually at home. You know, and that is you. And obviously, I'm sure that there are many people in Poland right now trying to figure out how to hack um, selfies. You know, like whether to put a video or something. You know, but there. And I mean, and that's the thing that you can be certain that. Once that the quarantine is in place, you know, and really enforceable and selective, some people either through a lack of social consideration or simply because they are forced because they don't have money and they have to leave the house and, you know, they feel that they, to feed their families, they will try to breach the, um, the restrictions. And at that point, it's going to be a very, very difficult call and, and we'll probably see an enhanced use of uh, technology to try to to try to do that. For example, in Hong Kong, the government has given um, people who are suspected um, of being infected a bracelet that they have to wear. And they actually, and the bracelet, you know, connects to the phone and provides location data. And I think that the idea with the bracelet is that basically you cannot take it off, no? So it's not, because of, I mean, the obvious thing to do if you are being traced to your phone is you leave your phone at home and then you go for a run. But with the brace that you can do that. So we are seeing quite a few um, initiatives like that. Then uh, the most, um, some, almost like the the most extreme uh, version of uh, that we've seen of the, or the most extreme approach has been in Israel, where the intelligence agency has been given uh, access to, well, authority to reduce. Um, like massive database they have already of pretty much all the mobile all the mobile phones in the country and the West Bank, and that has generated a huge amount of debate around the world. You know, saying that the Israelis are going a step too far. Unfortunately, the UK already has the same data and probably more, and the whole legal infrastructure to do exactly the same that the Israelis are doing right now. It seems unlikely that they will want to do it. Uh, first of all, because it's not uh, clear that the that type of location would give you um, enough accuracy to um, do contact tracing, and the um, and of also because of course the legal um, well there are there are no legal implications really I mean other than some minor tweaks possibly to some authorization but the um, there it wouldn't look very good to have the intelligence agency home you know MI5 and DCSQ doing this you know it would be and it would totally remove transparency but the um, technical and legal capabilities to do this whole thing through intelligence agencies is definitely there in the uk much more than in any other country in europe you know and also i guess we will know whether the israelis manage to make successful use but if, if israel says that they've actually successfully controlled the pandemic by using data you can assume that some people in the UK will be asking, why are we not doing the same? You know? And I think that this is the, the general pattern, you know, whatever works, 
uh, will be seen as a model. Unfortunately, you know, what we have to hope is that the least authoritarian um, approaches are successful and, you know, other countries like the UK that are arriving a bit later can try to copy those and not just, you know, the um, Israel or China, it's a, a lot worse. So that's the, I mean, I think those are some of the extreme. In between, you have things like uh, South Korea, where at the moment the, um, the government is using like massive data matching, you know, combining uh, CCTV cameras, interviews, of course, anyone who's infected is interviewed to see where they've been. And they also get uh, your banking records and your mobile phone uh, location and try to construct your history to see where you, who you may have infected. And that information in South Korea is actually made public. So you can go into our website and see that they don't put your name, but they put person X, you know, uh, who works in this place and goes to church in this particular place, you know, was is infected. And then, you know, there, there is actually a huge uh, crowdsourcing effort and lots of people from the open data movement, actually, you know, that are on this, you know, right now in South Korea trying to find out better ways of doing tracing and if they can find uh, more people that have been infected. But of course, in the European context, that would be absolutely unthinkable, you know, to put such a level of individual information. But in South Korea, uh, what you have is that if you refuse to give your location, um, the um, health and health authorities and police can obtain your communication records. And again, you know, the same system is in place in the UK, you know, where there are last data was 750,000 uh, requests for communications data, you know, including location from police and other authorities. In, that was 2017. But the infrastructure would be in place to do a similar approach to South Korea, uh, minus the public part. You know? So if you you are forced into quarantine or you are forced to declare your contacts, the police and actually um, and some NHS authorities could um, could obtain that data. And also in the context of emergencies and saving lives, the NHS trusts, actually ambulance trusts, they are called in law, they can already obtain your comms records, you know, so they could so they could try to get your own data for but that would be in an emergency and possibly contact tracing would not totally fit. So yeah, I mean basically we are seeing lots and lots of different initiatives, you know. Uh, at the moment the the UK seems to be also developing some form of app through NHS X, which is the innovation uh, arms length uh, body of the NHS. It's not completely clear, you know, and to be honest, the moment that you take your eyes off Twitter, you know, um, some news appear again, you know, so it may be that even now in a few hours, we have more detail from the last time I checked. But from what we know, it seems that this, pr um, this app is going to follow the Singapore model, more or less, which is based on Letting people to download, um, asking people to download an app on their phone that will keep a Bluetooth location and possibly GPS uh, in some cases, but not in not in Singapore, you know, but in other countries. Um, and they will keep your location, but mainly uh, what the app is trying to do is not to see where you have been, but try to identify other people using the same app who have been near you. So the app only checks uh, proximity. It doesn't keep uh, absolute or coordinates or geolocation. You know? So you know, you've been together, but you could have been together in the North Pole or you could have been together in London. And the idea is also that you need to have the phones together for something like half an hour for the match to be generated. Then if you're sick, uh, you're asked to then upload the data to the government and people who have signed up, they will then get a message, you know, who have the app and put their mobile, um, they will get a message saying that they should test because they may have been um, may have been infected. So that seems a much better approach. Now, of course, um, the success of that app relies on pretty much everyone having the app, you know. So if there is no uptake, uh, what it's likely is that at some point there will be calls for more draconian uh, measures, you know, whether it's like um, authorization from an individual level or just um, MI5 getting all the data of everyone in the UK and just, you know, uh, accessing it on tap. So those are the main things that we are, that we have found so far. And I think as uh, Jim said at the moment, you know, the, the legal framework is really pretty much everything there for any of these um, approaches, you know, so you could 
you would then need to change with very, very minor tweaks, you know, to legislation may in, be required in some cases, you know, maybe you want to change some authorities that can access data, or you need to um, create a new authorization, you know, administrative authorization, but we wouldn't need to change the legal framework, you know, and I think that, I mean, I think for us, the, the feeling so far is that there are ways of doing this thing properly, um, with, you know, trying to respect privacy and try to, you know, in, do it in a proportionate manner, but Right now, the most important thing, as Jim has said, is to really have transparency and to put all these things in the open rather than having to find out through exclusive, you know, leaks to, you know, journalists and trying to just follow up the whole thing on Twitter as if we were following the Kremlin or something, you know. So, yeah, that's, I think, a summary I've spoken. I think it's probably better to let people ask questions rather than go on. Yeah. Um, too long. Yeah. And also, I think we've got a few uh, comments and questions in the channel already. So, um, Jeff uh, mentions that mobile data can be more accurate than I remarked. I think that is true. I'm not sure it's always true. Um, but yes, sure, uh, if you have various other levels of information to combine with it, you can get it more accurate. And of course, um, you know, if you've got GPS, that also yeah. helps. Um, somebody also asked, um, under what laws can ambulance personnel obtain yeah. communication records? Uh, is that built into the Public Health Act? I think that's the um, investigatory powers regime. Yeah. So yeah. this is just simple uh, data requests, uh, usually for communications records, which you know doesn't require authorization uh, when it's just kind of whose phone number is it? That's pretty much just you you get that mm -hmm. yeah having said that there are um there is, in the emergency legislation there are very that's something that's also quite remarkable that emergency powers uh, through the is the public health emerging um epidemics or you know act i forgot the, the full name now or the civil contingencies act those uh, laws create huge powers to do things like a closing schools or uh, stopping people forcing population controls but there is a surprising little amount of uh, stuff there on actually information processing there are powers for authorities to command information from other authorities you know on things like um, for doing like planning and policy but there is uh, most of the powers for information in emergencies are already in the general surveillance and data protection laws. Yeah. Okay, so uh, a couple of other comments. Somebody, co um, I think it's uh, Ian, comments that uh, you know if, the, if 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 apps like that got uh, compulsory, he'd be tempted to ditch his smartphone. Uh, I think that's that's part of the set of worries here. That you know, compulsion doesn't necessarily give you the results that you want. Um, you, and you have to bring the public with you as, as a government, um, and that's I think the worry right now. They they don't seem to have their eye on that. Mm -hmm. um, has, have other people got comments or questions? I think we should open it up a bit. Uh, if you have, mm -hmm. just uh, either raise your hand or unmute. Uh, we have sixty people on the call, so it's probably an idea to raise your hand. I think.